Chapter Two, Part Two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Two, The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines. Part Two. Till the privileges of Romans had been progressively extended to all inhabitants of the empire, an important distinction was preserved between Italy and the provinces. The former was esteemed the centre of public unity, and the firm basis of the constitution. Italy claimed the birth, or at least the residence, of the emperors and the senate. The estates of the Italians were exempt from taxes, their persons from arbitrary jurisdiction of governors their municipal corporations formed after the perfect model of the capital were entrusted under the immediate eyes of the supreme power with the execution of the laws from the foot of the alps to the extremity of calabria all the natives of italy were born citizens of rome their partial distinctions were obliterated and they insensibly coalesced into one great nation united by language manners and civil institutions and equal to the weight of a powerful empire the republic gloried in her generous policy and was frequently rewarded by the merit and services of her adopted sons had she always confined the distinction of romans to the ancient families within the walls of the city that immortal name would have been deprived of some of its most noble ornaments virgil was a native of mantua horace was inclined to doubt whether he should call himself an apulian or a lucanian it was in Padua that an historian was found worthy to record the majestic series of Roman victories. The patriot family of the Catos emerged from Tusculum. The little town of Arpinum claimed the double honor of producing Marius and Cicero, the former of whom deserved, after Romulus and Camulus, to be styled the third founder of Rome, and the latter, after saving his country from the designs of Catiline, enabled her to contend with Athens for the palm of eloquence the provinces of the empire as they have been described in the preceding chapter were destitute of any public force or constitutional freedom and in etruria in greece and in gaul it was the first care of the senate to dissolve those dangerous confederacies which taught mankind that as the roman arms prevailed by division they might be resisted by union those princes whom the ostentation of gratitude or generosity permitted for a while to hold a precarious sceptre were dismissed from their thrones as soon as they had performed their appointed task of fashioning to the yoke the vanquished nations the free states and cities which had embraced the cause of rome were rewarded with a nominal alliance and insensibly sunk into real servitude the public authority was everywhere exercised by the ministers of the senate and the emperors and that authority was absolute and without control but the same salutary maxims of government which had secured the peace and obedience of italy were extended to the most distant conquests a nation of romans was gradually formed in the provinces by the double expedient of introducing colonies and of admitting the most faithful and deserving of the provincials to the freedom of rome wheresoever the roman conquers he inhabits is a very just observation of seneca confirmed by history and experience the natives of Italy, allured by pleasure or by interest, hastened to enjoy the advantages of victory, and we may remark that, about forty years after the reduction of Asia, eighty thousand Romans were massacred in one day by the cruel orders of Mithridates. These voluntary exiles were engaged, for the most part, in the occupations of commerce, agriculture, and the farm of the revenue. But after the legions were rendered permanent by the emperors, the provinces were peopled by a race of soldiers, and the veterans, whether they received the reward of their service in land or in money, usually settled with their families in the country where they had honorably spent their youth. Throughout the empire, but more particularly in the western parts, the most fertile districts, and the most convenient stations, were reserved for the establishment of colonies, some of which were of a civil and others of a military nature in their manners and internal policy the colonies formed a perfect representation of their great parent and they were soon endeared to the natives by the ties of friendship and alliance they effectually diffused a reverence for the roman name and a desire which was seldom disappointed of sharing in due time its honors and advantages the municipal cities insensibly equalled the rank and splendor of the colonies 
and in the reign of Hadrian it was disputed which was the preferable condition, of those societies which had issued from, or those which had been received into, the bosom of Rome. The right of Latium, as it was called, conferred on the cities to which it had been granted a more partial favor. The magistrates only, at the expiration of their office, assumed the quality of Roman citizens, but as these offices were annual, in a few years they circulated round the principal families. Those of the provincials who were permitted to bear arms in the legions, those who exercised any civil employment, all, in a word, who performed any public service, or displayed any personal talents, were rewarded with a present whose value was continually diminished by the increasing liberality of the emperors. Yet even in the age of the Antonines, when the freedom of the city had been bestowed on the greater number of their subjects, it was still accompanied with very solid advantages. The bulk of the people acquired, with that title, the benefit of the Roman laws, particularly in the interesting articles of marriage, testaments, and inheritance, and the road of fortune was open to those whose pretensions were seconded by favor or merit. The grandsons of the Gauls, who had besieged Julius Caesar in Alcia, commanded legions, governed provinces, and were admitted into the Senate of Rome. Their ambition, instead of disturbing the tranquillity of the state, was intimately connected with its safety and greatness. So sensible were the Romans of the influence of language over national manners that it was their most serious care to extend, with the progress of their arms, the use of the Latin tongue. The ancient dialects of Italy, the Sabine, the Etruscan, and the Venetian, sunk into oblivion. But in the provinces the East was less docile than the West to the voice of its victorious preceptors. This obvious difference marked the two portions of the empire with a distinction of colors which, though it was in some degree concealed during the meridian splendor of prosperity, became gradually more visible as the shades of night descended upon the Roman world. The western countries were civilized by the same hands which subdued them. As soon as the barbarians were reconciled to obedience, their minds were open to any new impressions of knowledge and politeness. The language of Virgil and Cicero, though with some inevitable mixture of corruption, was so universally adopted in Africa, Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Pannonia, that the faint traces of the Punic or Celtic idioms were preserved only in the mountains or among the peasants. Education and study insensibly inspired the natives of those countries with the sentiments of Rome, and Italy gave fashions as well as laws to her Latin provincials. They solicited with more ardor, and obtained with more faculty, the freedom and honors of the state, supported the national dignity in letters, and in arms, and at length, in the person of Trajan, produced an emperor whom the Scipios would not have disowned for their countrymen. The situation of the Greeks was very different from that of the barbarians. The former had been long civilized and corrupted. They had too much taste to relinquish their language, and too much vanity to adopt any foreign institutions. Still preserving the prejudices, after they had lost the virtues of their ancestors, they affected to despise the unpolished manners of the Roman conquerors, whilst they were compelled to respect their superior wisdom and power. Nor was the influence of the Grecian language and sentiments confined to the narrow limits of that once celebrated country. Their empire, by the progress of colonies and conquest, had been diffused from the Adriatic to the Euphrates and the Nile. Asia was covered with Greek cities, and the long reign of the Macedonian kings had introduced a silent revolution into Syria and Egypt. In their pompous courts, those princes united the elegance of Athens with the luxury of the East, and the example of the court was imitated, at an humble distance, by the higher ranks of their subjects. Such was the general division of the Roman Empire into the Latin and Greek languages. To these we may add a third distinction for the body of the natives in Syria, and especially in Egypt. The use of their ancient dialects, by secluding them from the commerce of mankind, checked the improvements of those barbarians. The slothful effeminacy of the former exposed them to the contempt, the sullen ferociousness of the latter excited the aversion of the conquerors. Those nations had submitted to the Roman power, but they seldom desired or deserved the freedom of the city and it was remarked that more than two hundred and thirty years elapsed after the ruin of the Ptolemies before an Egyptian was admitted into the Senate of Rome. It is a just, though trite, observation that victorious Rome was herself subdued by the arts of Greece. 
Those immortal writers who still command the admiration of modern Europe soon became the favorite object of study and imitation in Italy and the western provinces. But the elegant amusements of the Romans were not suffered to intervene with their sound maxims of policy. Whilst they acknowledged the charms of the Greek, they asserted the dignity of the Latin tongue, and the exclusive use of the latter was inflexibly maintained in the administration of civil as well as military government but two languages exercised at the same time their separate jurisdiction throughout the empire the former as the natural idiom of science the latter as the legal dialect of public transactions those who united letters with business were equally conversant with both and it was almost impossible in any province to find a roman subject of a liberal education who was at once a stranger to the greek and to the latin language it was by such institutions that the nations of the empire insensibly melted away into the Roman name and people. But there still remained, in the center of every province and of every family, an unhappy condition of men who endured the weight without sharing the benefits of society. In the free states of antiquity the domestic slaves were exposed to the wanton rigor of despotism. The perfect settlement of the Roman empire was preceded by ages of violence and rapine. The slaves consisted, for the most part, of barbarian captives, taken in thousands by the chance of war, purchased at a vile price, accustomed to a life of independence, and impatient to break and to revenge their fetters. Against such internal enemies, whose desperate insurrections had more than once reduced the Republic to the brink of destruction, the most severe regulations and the most cruel treatment seemed almost justified by the great law of self-preservation. But when the principal nations of Europe, Asia, and Africa were united under the laws of one sovereign, the source of foreign supplies flowed with much less abundance, and the Romans were reduced to the milder but more tedious method of propagation. In their numerous families, and particularly in their country estates, they encouraged the marriage of their slaves. The sentiments of nature, the habits of education, and the possession of a dependent species of property contributed to alleviate the hardships of servitude. The existence of a slave became an object of greater value, and though his happiness still depended on the temper and circumstances of the master, the humanity of the latter, instead of being restrained by fear, was encouraged by the sense of his own interest. The progress of manners was accelerated by the virtue or policy of the emperors, and by the edicts of Hadrian and the Antonines, the protection of the laws was extended to the abject part of mankind. The jurisdiction of life and death over the slaves, a power long exercised and often abused, was taken out of private hands, and reserved to the magistrates alone. The subterraneous prisons were abolished, and upon a just complaint of intolerable treatment, the injured slave obtained either his deliverance or a less cruel master. Hope, the best comfort of our imperfect condition, was not denied to the Roman slave, and if he had any opportunity of rendering himself either useful or agreeable, he might very naturally expect that the diligence and fidelity of a few years would be rewarded with the inestimable gift of freedom. The benevolence of the master was so frequently prompted by the meaner suggestions of vanity and avarice, that the laws found it more necessary to restrain than encourage a profuse and undistinguishing liberty, which might degenerate into a very dangerous abuse. It was a maxim of ancient jurisprudence that a slave had not any country of his own. He acquired, with his liberty, an admission into the political society of which his patron was a member. The consequences of this maxim would have prostituted the privileges of the Roman city to a mean and promiscuous multitude. Some seasonable exceptions were therefore provided, and the honorable distinction was confined to such slaves only as, for just causes, and with the approbation of the magistrate, should receive a solemn and legal manumission. Even these chosen freedmen obtained no more than the private rights of citizens, and were rigorously excluded from civil or military honors. Whatever might be the merit or fortune of their sons, they likewise were esteemed unworthy of a seat in the Senate nor were the traces of a servile origin allowed to be completely obliterated till the third or fourth generation. Without destroying the distinction of ranks, a distant prospect of freedom and honors was presented, even to those whom pride and prejudice almost disdained to number among the human species. It was once proposed to discriminate the slaves by a peculiar habit, but it was justly apprehended that there might be some danger in acquainting them with their own numbers. 
without interpreting in their utmost strictness the liberal appellations of legions and myriads, we may venture to pronounce that the proportion of slaves who were valued as property was more considerable than that of servants, who can be computed only as an expense. The youths of a promising genius were instructed in the arts and sciences, and their price was ascertained by the degree of their skill and talents. Almost every profession, either liberal or mechanical, might be found in the household of an opulent senator. The ministers of pomp and sensuality were multiplied beyond the conception of modern luxury. It was more for the interest of the merchant or manufacturer to purchase than to hire his workmen, and in the country slaves were employed as the cheapest and most laborious instruments of agriculture. To confirm the general observation, and to display the multitude of slaves, we might allege a variety of peculiar instances. It was discovered, on a very melancholy occasion, that four hundred slaves were maintained in a single palace of Rome. The same number of four hundred belonged to an estate which an African widow of a very private condition resigned to her son, whilst she reserved for herself a much larger share of her property. A freedman under the name of Augustus, though his fortune had suffered great losses in the civil wars, left behind him three thousand six hundred yoke of oxen, two hundred and fifty thousand head of smaller cattle, and what was almost included in the description of cattle, four thousand one hundred and sixteen slaves. The number of subjects who acknowledge the laws of Rome, of citizens, of provincials, and slaves, cannot now be fixed with such a degree of accuracy as the importance of the object would deserve. We are informed that when the Emperor Claudius exercised the office of censor, he took an account of six millions nine hundred and forty-five thousand Roman citizens, who, with the proportion of women and children, must have amounted to about twenty millions of souls. The multitude of objects of an inferior rank was uncertain and fluctuating, but after weighing with attention every circumstance which could influence the balance, it seems probable that there existed in the time of Claudius about twice as many provincials as there were citizens, of either sex and of every age, and that the slaves were at least equal in number to the free inhabitants of the Roman world. The total amount of this imperfect calculation would rise to about one hundred and twenty millions of persons, a degree of population which possibly exceeds that of modern Europe and forms the most numerous society that has ever been united under the same system of government. End of Part 2Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE DECLINE AND FALL OF THE ROMAN EMPIRE by Edward Gibbon CHAPTER Two: THE INTERNAL PROSPERITY IN THE AGE OF THE ANTONINES PART Three: Domestic peace and union were the natural consequences of the modern and comprehensive policy embraced by the Romans. If we turn our eyes towards the monarchies of Asia, we shall behold despotism in the center and weakness in the extremities, the collection of the revenue or the administration of justice enforced by the presence of an army, hostile barbarians established in the heart of the country, hereditary satraps usurping the domination of the provinces, and subjects inclined to rebellion, though incapable of freedom. But the obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary, and permanent. The vanquished nations blended into one great people, resigned the hope, nay, even the wish, of resuming their independence, and scarcely considered their own existence as distinct from the existence of Rome. The established authority of the emperors pervaded without an effort the wide extent of their dominions, and was exercised with the same faculty on the banks of the Thames or of the Nile as on those of the Tiber. The legions were destined to serve against the public enemy, and the civil magistrate seldom required the aid of a military force. In this state of general security, the leisure, as well as opulence, both of prince and people, were devoted to improve and to adorn the Roman Empire. Among the innumerable monuments of architecture constructed by the Romans, how many have escaped the notice of history, how few have resisted the ravages of time and barbarism. And yet even the majestic ruins that are still scattered over Italy and the provinces would be sufficient to prove that these countries were once the seat of a polite and powerful empire. 
Their greatness alone, or their beauty, might deserve our attention, but they are rendered more interesting by two important circumstances which connect the agreeable history of the arts with the more useful history of human manners. Many of these works were erected at private expense, and almost all were intended for public benefit. It is natural to suppose that the greatest number, as well as the most considerable of the Roman edifices, were raised by the emperors who possessed so unbounded a command both of men and money. Augustus was accustomed to boast that he had found his capital of brick, and that he had left it of marble. The strict economy of Vespasian was the source of his magnificence. The works of Trajan bear the stamp of his genius. The public monuments with which Hadrian adorned every province of the empire were executed not only by his orders, but under his immediate inspection. He was himself an artist, and he loved the arts, as they conduced to the glory of the monarch. They were encouraged by the Antonines, as they contributed to the happiness of the people. But if the emperors were the first, they were not the only architects of their dominions. Their example was universally imitated by their principal subjects, who were not afraid of declaring to the world that they had spirit to conceive and wealth to accomplish the noblest undertakings. Scarcely had the proud structure of the Colosseum been dedicated at Rome before the edifices of a smaller scale indeed, but of the same design and materials, were erected for the use and at the expense of the cities of Capua and Verona. The inscription of the stupendous bridge of Alcantara attests that it was thrown over the Tagus by the contribution of a few Lusitanian communities. When Pliny was entrusted with the government of Bithynia and Pontus, provinces by no means the richest or most considerable of the empire, he found the cities within his jurisdiction striving with each other in every useful and ornamental work that might deserve the curiosity of strangers or the gratitude of their citizens. It was the duty of the proconsul to supply their deficiencies, to direct their taste, and sometimes to moderate their emulation. The opulent senators of Rome and the provinces esteemed it an honor, and almost an obligation, to adorn the splendor of their age and country, and the influence of fashion very frequently supplied the want of taste or generosity. Among a crowd of these private benefactors we may select Herodus Atticus, an Athenian citizen who lived in the age of the Antonines. Whatever might be the motive of his conduct, his magnificence would have been worthy of the greatest kings. The family of Herod, at least after it had been favored by fortune, was lineally descended from Simon and Miltiades, Theseus and Cecrops, Asus and Jupiter. But the posterity of so many gods and heroes was fallen into the most abject state. His grandfather had suffered by the hands of justice, and Julius Atticus, his father, must have ended his life in poverty and contempt had he not discovered an immense treasure buried under an old house, the last remains of his patrimony. According to the rigor of the law, the emperor might have asserted his claim, and the prudent Atticus prevented, by a frank confession, the officiousness of informers. But the equitable Nerva, who then filled the throne, refused to accept any part of it, and commanded him to use, without scruple, the present of fortune. The cautious Athenian still insisted that the treasure was too considerable for a subject, and that he knew not how to use it. Abuse it, then, replied the monarch, with a good-natured peevishness, for it is your own. Many will be of the opinion that Atticus literally obeyed the emperor's last instructions, since he expended the great part of his fortune, which was much increased by an advantageous marriage, in the service of the public. He had obtained for his son Herod the prefecture of the free cities of Asia, and the young magistrate, observing that the town of Troas was indifferently supplied with water, obtained from the munificence of Hadrian three hundred myriads of drachmas, about a hundred thousand pounds, for the construction of a new aqueduct. But in the execution of the work, the charge amounted to more than double the estimate, and the officers of the revenue began to murmur till the generous Atticus silenced their complaints by requesting that he might be permitted to take upon himself the whole additional expense. The ablest preceptors of Greece and Asia had been invited by liberal rewards to direct the education of young Herod. Their pupil soon became a celebrated orator, according to the useless rhetoric of that age, which, confining itself to the schools, disdained to visit either the Forum or the Senate. He was honored with the consulship at Rome, but the greatest part of his life was spent in a philosophic retirement at Athens and his adjacent villas, perpetually surrounded by sophists, who acknowledged without reluctance the superiority of a rich and generous rival. The monuments of his genius have perished, some considerable ruins still preserve the fame of his taste and munificence, 
modern travellers have measured the remains of the stadium which he constructed at Athens. It was six hundred feet in length, built entirely of white marble, capable of admitting the whole body of the people, and finished in four years, whilst Herod was president of the Athenian games. To the memory of his wife Regula he dedicated a theatre, scarcely to be paralleled in the empire. No wood except cedar, very curiously carved, was employed in any part of the building. The odium, designed by Pericles for musical performances, and the rehearsal of new tragedies, have been a trophy of the victory of the arts over barbaric greatness, as the timbers employed in the construction consisted chiefly of the masts of the Persian vessels. Notwithstanding the repairs bestowed on that ancient edifice by a king of Cappadocia, it was again fallen to decay. Herod restored its ancient beauty and magnificence. Nor was the liberality of that illustrious citizen confined to the walls of Athens. The most splendid ornaments bestowed on the temple of Neptune in Isthmus, at a theatre in Corinth, a stadium at Delphi, a bath at Thermopylae, and an aqueduct at Canusium in Italy, were insufficient to exhaust his treasures. The people of Epirus, Thessaly, Eboa, Boeotia, and Peloponnesus experienced his favors, and many inscriptions of the cities of Greece and Asia gratefully style Herodus Atticus their patron and benefactor. In the commonwealths of Athens and Rome, the modest simplicity of private houses announced the equal condition of freedom, whilst the sovereignty of the people was represented in the majestic edifices designed to the public use. Nor was this republican spirit totally extinguished by the introduction of wealth and monarchy. It was in the works of national honor and benefit that the most virtuous of the emperors affected to display their magnificence. The golden palace of Nero excited a just indignation, but the vast extent of ground which had been usurped by his selfish luxury was more nobly filled under the succeeding reigns by the Colosseum, the Baths of Titus, the Claudian Portico, and the temples dedicated to the goddess of peace and to the genius of Rome. These monuments of architecture, the property of the Roman people, were adorned with the most beautiful productions of Grecian painting and sculpture, and in the Temple of Peace a very curious library was opened to the curiosity of the learned. At a small distance from thence was situated the Forum of Trajan. It was surrounded by a lofty portico in the form of a quadrangle into which four triumphal arches opened a noble and spacious entrance. In the centre arose a column of marble whose height of one hundred and ten feet denoted the elevation of the hill that had been cut away. This column, which still subsists in its ancient beauty, exhibited an exact representation of the Dacian victories of its founder. The veteran soldier contemplated the story of his own campaigns, and by an easy illustration of national victory the peaceful citizen associated himself to the honors of the triumph. All the other quarters of the capital, and all the provinces of the empire, were embellished by the same liberal spirit of public magnificence, and were filled with amphitheaters, theaters, temples, porticos, triumphal arches, baths, and aqueducts, all variously conducive to the health, the devotion, and the pleasures of the meanest citizen. The last mentioned of those edifices deserve our peculiar attention. The boldness of the enterprise, the solidity of the execution, and the uses to which they were subservient rank the aqueducts among the noblest monuments of Roman genius and power. The aqueducts of the capital claim a just preeminence, but the curious traveller who, without the light of history, should examine those of Spoleto, of Metz, or of Segovia, would very naturally conclude that those provincial towns had formerly been the residence of some potent monarch. The solitudes of Asia and Africa were once covered with flourishing cities, whose populousness and even whose existence was derived from such artificial supplies of a perennial stream of fresh water. We have computed the inhabitants and contemplated the public works of the Roman Empire. The observation of the number and greatness of its cities will serve to confirm the former, and to multiply the latter. It may not be unpleasing to collect a few scattered instances relative to that subject, without forgetting, however, that from the vanity of nations and the poverty of language the vague appellation of city has been indifferently bestowed on Rome and upon Laurentium. 1. Ancient Italy is said to have contained 1,197 cities, and for whatsoever era of antiquity that expression might be intended, there is not any reason to believe the country less populous in the age of the Antonines than in that of Romulus. The petty states of Latium were contained within the metropolis of the empire, by whose superior influence they had been attracted. 
those parts of Italy which have so long languished under the lazy tyranny of priests and viceroys, had been afflicted only by the more tolerable calamities of war, and the first symptoms of decay which they experienced were amply compensated by the rapid movements of the Cisalpine Gaul. The splendor of Verona may be traced in its remains, yet Verona was less celebrated than Aquileia or Padua, Milan or Ravenna. 2. The spirit of improvement had passed the Alps, and had been felt even in the woods of Britain, which were gradually cleared away to open a free space for convenient and elegant habitations. York was the seat of government. London was already enriched by commerce, and Bath was celebrated for the salutary effects of its medicinal waters. Gaul could boast of her twelve hundred cities, and though in the northern parts many of them, without excepting Paris itself, were little more than the rude and imperfect townships of a rising people, the southern provinces imitated the wealth and elegance of Italy. Many were the cities of Gaul, Marseilles, Arles, Narbonne, Toulouse, Bordeaux, Autun, Vienna, Lyon, Langres, and Treves, whose ancient condition might sustain an equal and perhaps advantageous comparison with their present state. With regard to Spain, that country flourishes a province, and has declined as a kingdom. Exhausted by the abuse of her strength, by America, and by superstition, her pride might possibly be confounded, if we require such a list of three hundred and sixty cities, as Pliny has exhibited under the reign of Vespasian. 3. Three hundred African cities had once acknowledged the authority of Carthage, nor is it likely that their numbers diminished under the administration of the emperors. Carthage itself rose with new splendor from its ashes, and that capital, as well as Capua and Corinth, soon recovered all the advantages which can be separated from independent sovereignty. 4. The provinces of the East present the contrast of Roman magnificence with Turkish barbarism. The ruins of antiquity scattered over uncultivated fields and ascribed by ignorance to the power of magic scarcely afford a shelter to the oppressed peasant or wandering Arab. Under the reign of the Caesars, the proper Asia alone contained five hundred populous cities, enriched with all the gifts of nature, and adorned with all the refinements of art. Eleven cities of Asia had once disputed the honor of dedicating a temple of Tiberius, and their respective merits were examined by the Senate. Four of them were immediately rejected as unequal to the burden, and among these was Laodicea, whose splendor is still displayed in its ruins. Laodicea collected a very considerable revenue from its flocks of sheep, celebrated for the fineness of their wool, and had received, a little before the contest, a legacy of above four hundred thousand pounds by the testament of a generous citizen. If such was the poverty of Laodicea, what must have been the wealth of those cities whose claim appeared preferable, and particularly of Pergamus, of Smyrna, and of Ephesus, who so long disputed with each other the titular primacy of Asia? The capitals of Syria and Egypt held a still superior rank in the empire. Antioch and Alexandria looked down with disdain on a crowd of dependent cities, and yielded with reluctance to the majesty of Rome itself. End of Part 3Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon Chapter 2. The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines Part 4. All these cities were connected with each other and with the capital by the public highways, which, issuing from the Forum of Rome, traversed Italy, pervaded the provinces, and were terminated only by the frontiers of the empire. If we carefully trace the distance from the wall of Antoninus to Rome, and from thence to Jerusalem, it will be found that the great chain of communication from the northwest to the southeast point of the empire was drawn out to the length of four thousand and eighty Roman miles. The public roads were accurately divided by milestones, and ran in a direct line from one city to another, with very little respect for the obstacles either of nature or private property. Mountains were perforated, and bold arches thrown over the broadest and most rapid streams. 
The middle part of the road was raised into a terrace which commanded the adjacent country, consisted of several strata of sand, gravel, and cement, and was paved with large stones, or in some places, near the capital, with granite. Such was the solid construction of the Roman highways, whose firmness has not entirely yielded to the effort of fifteen centuries. They united the subjects of the most distant provinces by an easy and familiar intercourse. Out their primary object had been to facilitate the marches of their legions, nor was any country considered as completely subdued till it had been rendered in all its parts pervious to the arms and authority of the conqueror. The advantage of receiving the earliest intelligence, and of conveying their orders with celerity, induced the emperors to establish, throughout their extensive dominions, the regular institution of posts. Houses were everywhere erected at the distance of only five or six miles. Each of them was constantly provided with forty horses, and by the help of these relays, it was easy to travel a hundred miles in a day along the Roman roads. The use of post was allowed to those who claimed it by an imperial mandate, but though originally intended for the public service, it was sometimes indulged to the business or conveniency of private citizens. Nor was the communication of the Roman Empire less free and open by sea than it was by land. The provinces surrounded and enclosed the Mediterranean, and Italy, in the shape of an immense promontory, advanced into the midst of that gray lake. The coasts of Italy are, in general, destitute of safe harbors, but human industry had corrected the deficiencies of nature, and the artificial port of Ostia, in particular, situated at the mouth of the Tiber, and formed by the Emperor Claudius, was a useful monument of Roman greatness. From this port, which was only sixteen miles from the capital, a favorable breeze carried vessels in seven days to the columns of Hercules, and in nine or ten to Alexandria in Egypt. Whatever evils either reason or declamation have imputed to extensive empire, the power of Rome was attended with some beneficial consequences to mankind, and the same freedom of intercourse which extended the vices diffused likewise the improvements of social life. In the more remote ages of antiquity the world was unequally divided. The East was in the immemorable possession of arts and luxury, whilst the West was inhabited by rude and warlike barbarians, who either disdained agriculture or to whom it was totally unknown. Under the protection of an established government, the productions of happier climates and the industry of more civilized nations were gradually induced into the western countries of Europe, and the natives were encouraged by an open and profitable commerce to multiply the former, as well as to improve the latter. It would be almost impossible to enumerate all the articles, either of the animal or the vegetable rain, which were successively imported into Europe from Asia and Egypt. But it will not be unworthy of the dignity, and much less of the utility, of an historical work slightly to touch on a few of the principal heads. 1. Almost all the flowers, the herbs, and the fruits that grow in our European gardens are of foreign extraction, which, in many cases, is betrayed even by their names. The apple was a native of Italy, and when the Romans had tasted the richer flavor of the apricot, the peach, the pomegranate, the citron, and the orange, they contented themselves with applying to all these new fruits the common denomination of apple, discriminating them from each other by the additional epithet of their country. In the time of Homer, the vine grew wild in the island of Sicily, and most probably in the adjacent continent, but it was not improved by the skill, nor did it afford a liquor grateful to the taste of the savage inhabitants. A thousand years afterwards, Italy could boast that of the fourscore most generous and celebrated wines, more than two-thirds were produced from her soil. The blessing was soon communicated to the Narbonese province of Gaul, but so intense was the cold to the north of the Savinese, that in the time of Strabo it was thought impossible to ripen the grapes in those parts of Gaul. This difficulty, however, was gradually vanquished, and there is some reason to believe that the vineyards of Burgundy are as old as the age of the Antonines. 3. The olive in the western world followed the progress of peace, of which it was considered as the symbol. Two centuries after the foundation of Rome, both Italy and Africa were strangers to that useful plant. It was naturalized in those countries, and at length carried into the heart of Spain and Gaul. The timid errors of the ancients, that it required a certain degree of heat, and could only flourish in the neighborhood of the sea, were insensibly exploded by industry and experience. 4. The cultivation of flax was transported from Egypt to Gaul, and enriched the whole country, however it might impoverish the particular lands on which it was sown. 5. 
The use of artificial grasses became familiar to the farmers both of Italy and the provinces, particularly the Lucerne, which derived its name and origin from Medea. The assured supply of wholesome and plentiful food for the cattle during winter multiplied the number of the docks and herds, which in their turn contributed to the fertility of the soil. To all these improvements may be added an assiduous attention to mines and fisheries, which, by employing a multitude of laborious hands, serve to increase the pleasures of the rich and the subsistence of the poor. The elegant treatise of Colomela describes the advanced state of the Spanish husbandry under the reign of Tiberius, and it may be observed that those famines which so frequently afflicted the infant republic were seldom or never experienced by the extensive empire of Rome. The accidental scarcity in any single province was immediately relieved by the plenty of its more fortunate neighbors. Agriculture is the foundation of manufactures, since the productions of nature are the materials of art. Under the Roman Empire, the labor of an industrious and ingenious people was variously but incessantly employed in the service of the rich. In their dress, their table, their houses, and their furniture, the favors of fortune united every refinement of conveniency, of elegance, and of splendor, whatever could soothe their pride or gratify their sensuality. Such refinements, under the odious name of luxury, have been severely arraigned by the moralists of every age and it might perhaps be more conducive to the virtue as well as happiness of mankind if all possessed the necessities and none the superfluities of life but in the present imperfect condition of society luxury though it may proceed from vice or folly seems to be the only means that can correct the unequal distribution of poverty the diligent mechanic and the skilful artist who have obtained no share in the division of the earth receive a voluntary tax from the possessors of land and the latter are prompted by a sense of interest to improve these estates with whose produce they may purchase additional pleasures this operation the particular effects of which are felt in every society acted with much more diffusive energy in the roman world the provinces would soon have been exhausted of their wealth if the manufactures and commerce of luxury had not insensibly restored to the industrious subjects the sums which were extracted from them by the arms and authority of rome as long as the circulation was confined within the bounds of the empire, it impressed the political machine with a new degree of activity, and its consequences, sometimes beneficial, could never become pernicious. But it is no easy task to confine luxury within the limits of an empire. The most remote countries of the ancient world were ransacked to supply the pomp and delicacy of Rome. The forests of Scythia afforded some valuable furs amber was brought over land from the shores of the baltic to the danube and the barbarians were astonished at the price which they received in exchange for so useless a commodity there was a considerable demand for babylonian carpets and other manufactures of the east but the most important and unpopular branch of foreign trade was carried on with arabia and india every year about the time of the summer solstice a fleet of a hundred and twenty vessels sailed from mios hormos a port of egypt on the red sea by the periodical assistance of the monsoons they traversed the ocean in about forty days the coast of malabar or the island of ceylon was the usual term of their navigation and it was in those markets that the merchants from the more remote countries of asia expected their arrival the return of the fleet of Egypt was fixed to the months of December or January, and as soon as their rich cargo had been transported on the backs of camels from the Red Sea to the Nile, and had descended that river as far as Alexandria, it was poured without delay into the capital of the empire. The objects of oriental traffic were splendid and trifling, silk, a pound of which was esteemed not inferior in value to a pound of gold, precious stones, among which the pearl claimed the first rank after the diamond and a variety of aromatics that were consumed in religious worship and the pomp of funerals. The labor and risk of the voyage was rewarded with almost incredible profit, but the profit was made upon Roman subjects, and a few individuals were enriched at the expense of the public. As the natives of Arabia and India were contented with the productions and manufacture of their own country, silver on the side of the Romans was the principal, if not the only, instrument of commerce. It was a complaint worthy of the gravity of the Senate, that in the purchase of female ornaments the wealth of the state was irrevocably given away to foreign and hostile nations the annual loss is computed by a writer of an inquisitive but censorious temper at upwards of eight hundred thousand pounds sterling
Such was the style of discontent, brooding over the dark prospect of approaching poverty. And yet if we compare the proportion between gold and silver, as it stood in the time of Pliny, and as it was fixed in the reign of Constantine, we shall discover within that period a very considerable increase. There is not the least reason to suppose that gold was become more scarce. It is therefore evident that silver was grown more common, that whatever might be the amount of the Indian and Arabian exports, they were far from exhausting the wealth of the Roman world, and that the produce of the mines abundantly supplied the demands of commerce. Notwithstanding the propensity of mankind to exalt the past, and to depreciate the present, the tranquil and prosperous state of the empire was warmly felt and honestly confessed by the provincials as well as Rome. They acknowledged that the true principles of social life, laws, agriculture, and science, which had been first invented by the wisdom of Athens, were now firmly established by the power of Rome, under whose auspicious influence the fiercest barbarians were united by an equal government and common language. They affirmed that with the improvement of arts the human species were visibly multiplied. They celebrate the increasing splendor of the cities, the beautiful face of the country, cultivated and adorned like an immense garden, and the long festival of peace which was enjoyed by so many nations, forgetful of the ancient animosities and delivered from the apprehension of future danger. Whatever suspicions may be suggested by the air of rhetoric and declamation which seems to prevail in these passages, the substance of them is perfectly agreeable to historical truth. It was scarcely possible that the eyes of contemporaries should discover in the public felicity the latent causes of decay and corruption. This long peace and the uniform government of the Romans introduced a slow and secret poison into the vitals of the empire. The minds of men were gradually reduced to the same level, the fire of genius was extinguished, and even the military spirit evaporated. The natives of Europe were brave and robust. Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Illyricum supplied the legions with excellent soldiers and constituted the real strength of the monarchy. Their personal valor remained, but they no longer possessed that public courage which is nourished by the love of independence the sense of national honor, the presence of danger, and the habit of command. They received laws and governors from the will of their sovereign, and trusted for their defense to a mercenary army. The posterity of their boldest leaders was contented with the rank of citizens and subjects. The most aspiring spirits resorted to the court or standard of the emperors, and the deserted provinces, deprived of political strength or union, insensibly sunk into the languid indifference of private life. The love of letters, almost inseparable from peace and refinement, was fashionable among the subjects of Hadrian and the Antonines, who were themselves men of learning and curiosity. It was diffused over the whole extent of their empire. The most northern tribes of Britons had acquired a taste for rhetoric, Homer, as well as Virgil, were transcribed and studied on the banks of the Rhine and Danube, and the most liberal rewards sought out the faintest glimmerings of literary merit. The sciences of physic and astronomy were successfully cultivated by the Greeks. The observations of Ptolemy and the writings of Galen are studied by those who have improved their discoveries and corrected their errors. But if we accept the inimitable Lucian, this age of indolence passed away without having produced a single writer of original genius, or who excelled in the arts of elegant composition. The authority of Plato and Aristotle, of Zeno and Epicurus, still reigned in the schools, and their systems, transmitted with blind deference from one generation of disciples to another, precluded every generous attempt to exercise the powers or enlarge the limits of the human mind. The beauties of the poets and orators, instead of kindling a fire like their own, inspired only cold and servile mitations, or if any ventured to deviate from these models, they deviated at the same time from good sense and propriety. On the revival of letters, the youthful vigor of the imagination, after a long repose, national emulation, a new religion, new languages, and a new world, called forth the genius of Europe. But the provincials of Rome, trained by a uniform artificial foreign education, were engaged in a very unequal competition with those bold ancients who, by expressing their genuine feelings in their native tongue, had already occupied every place of honor. The name of poet was almost forgotten, that of orator was usurped by the sophists. 
a cloud of critics of compilers of commentators darkened the face of learning and the decline of genius was soon followed by the corruption of taste the sublime longinus who in somewhat a later period and in the court of a syrian queen preserved the spirit of ancient athens observes and laments this degeneracy of his contemporaries which debased their sentiments enervated their courage and depressed their talents in the same manner says he as some children always remain pygmies whose infant limbs have been too closely confined thus our tender minds fettered by the prejudices and habits of a just servitude are unable to expand themselves or to attain that well-proportioned greatness which we admire in the ancients who living under a populous government wrote with the same freedom as they acted this diminutive stature of mankind if we pursue the metaphor was daily sinking below the old standard and the roman world was indeed peopled by a race of pygmies when the fierce giants of the north broke in and mended the puny breed they restored a manly spirit of freedom and after the revolution of ten centuries freedom became the happy parent of taste and science end of part four Chapter Three, Part One of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. Chapter Three The Constitution in the Age of the Antonines, Part One of the Constitution of the Roman Empire in the Age of the Antonines the obvious definition of a monarchy seems to be that of a state in which a single person by whatsoever name he may be distinguished is entrusted with the execution of the laws the management of the revenue and the command of the army but unless public liberty is protected by intrepid and vigilant guardians the authority of so formidable a magistrate will soon degenerate into despotism the influence of the clergy in an age of superstition might be usefully employed to assert the rights of mankind but so intimate is the connection between the throne and the altar that the banner of the church has very seldom been seen on the side of the people a martial nobility and stubborn commons possessed of arms tenacious of property and collected into constitutional assemblies form the only balance capable of preserving a free constitution against enterprises of an aspiring prince every barrier of the roman constitution had been levelled by the vast ambition of the dictator every fence had been extirpated by the cruel hand of the triumvir after the victory of actium the fate of the roman world depended on the will of octavianus surnamed caesar by his uncle's adoption and afterwards augustus by the flattery of the senate the conqueror was at the head of forty-four veteran legions conscious of their own strength and of the weakness of the constitution habituated during twenty years civil war to every act of blood and violence and passionately devoted to the house of caesar from whence alone they had received and expected the most lavish rewards the provinces long oppressed by the ministers of the republic sighed for the government of a single person who would be the master not the accomplice of those petty tyrants the people of rome viewing with a secret pleasure the humiliation of the aristocracy demanded only bread and public shows and were supplied with both by the liberal hand of augustus the rich and polite italians who had almost universally embraced the philosophy of epicurus enjoyed the present blessings of ease and tranquillity and suffered not the pleasing dream to be interrupted by the memory of their old tumultuous freedom with its power the senate had lost its dignity many of the most noble families were extinct the republicans of spirit and ability had perished in the field of battle or in the proscription the door of the assembly had been designedly left open for a mixed multitude of more than a thousand persons who reflected disgrace upon their rank instead of deriving honour from it the reformation of the senate was one of the first steps in which augustus laid aside the tyrant and professed himself the father of his country he was elected censor and in concert with his faithful agrippa he examined a list of the senators expelled a few members whose vices or whose obstinacy required a public example persuaded near two hundred to prevent the shame of an expulsion by a voluntary retreat raised the qualification of a senator to about ten thousand pounds created a sufficient number of patrician families and accepted for himself the honourable title of prince of the senate which had always been bestowed by the censors on the citizen most eminent for his honours and services 
but whilst he thus restored the dignity he destroyed the independence of the senate the principles of a free constitution are irrevocably lost when the legislative power is nominated by the executive before an assembly thus modelled and prepared augustus pronounced a studied oration which displayed his patriotism and disguised his ambition Quote, he lamented yet excused his past conduct filial piety had required at his hands the revenge of his father's murder the humanity of his own nature had sometimes given way to the stern laws of necessity and to a forced connection with two unworthy colleagues as long as antony lived the republic forbade him to abandon her to a degenerate roman and a barbarian queen he was now at liberty to satisfy his duty and his inclination he solemnly restored the senate and people to all their ancient rights and wished only to mingle with the crowd of his fellow-citizens and to share the blessings which he had obtained for his country End quote. It would require the pen of Tacitus, if Tacitus had assisted at this assembly, to describe the various emotions of the Senate, those that were suppressed, and those that were affected. It was dangerous to trust the sincerity of Augustus. To seem to distrust it was still more dangerous. The respective advantages of monarchy and a republic have often divided speculative inquirers. The present greatness of the Roman state, the corruption of manners, and the license of the soldiers supplied new arguments to the advocates of monarchy and these general views of government were again warped by the hopes and fears of each individual amidst this confusion of sentiments the answer of the senate was unanimous and decisive they refused to accept the resignation of augustus they conjured him not to desert the republic which he had saved after a decent resistance the crafty tyrant submitted to the orders of the senate and consented to receive the government of the provinces and the general command of the roman armies under the well-known names of proconsul and imperator but he would receive them only for ten years even before the expiration of that period he hoped that the wounds of civil discord would be completely healed and that the republic restored to its pristine health and vigour would no longer require the dangerous interposition of so extraordinary a magistrate the memory of this comedy repeated several times during the life of augustus was preserved to the last ages of the empire by the peculiar pomp by which the perpetual monarchs of rome always solemnized the ten years of their reign without any violation of the principles of the constitution the general of the roman armies might receive and exercise an authority almost despotic over the soldiers the enemies and the subjects of the republic with regard to the soldiers the jealousy of freedom had even from the earliest ages of rome given way to the hopes of conquest and a just sense of military discipline the dictator or consul had a right to command the services of the roman youth and to punish an obstinate or cowardly disobedience by the most severe and ignominious penalties by striking the offender out of the list of citizens by confiscating his property and by selling his person into slavery the most sacred rights of freedom confirmed by the portian and sempronian laws were suspended by military engagement in his camp the general exercised an absolute power of life and death his jurisdiction was not confined by any forms of trial or rules of proceeding and the execution of the sentence was immediate and without appeal the choice of the enemies of rome was regularly decided by the legislative authority the most important resolutions of peace and war were seriously debated in the senate and solemnly ratified by the people but when the arms of the legions were carried to a great distance from italy the general assumed the liberty of directing them against whatever people and in whatever manner they judged most advantageous for the public service it was from the success not from the justice of their enterprises that they expected the honours of a triumph in the use of victory especially after they were no longer controlled by the commissioners of the senate they exercised the most unbounded despotism when pompey commanded in the east he rewarded his soldiers and allies dethroned princes divided kingdoms founded colonies and distributed the treasures of the mithridates on his return to rome he obtained by a single act of the senate and people the universal ratification of all his proceedings such was the power over the soldiers and over the enemies of rome which was either granted to or assumed by the generals of the republic they were at the same time the governors or rather monarchs of the conquered provinces united the civil with the military character administered justice as well as the finances and exercised both the executive and legislative power of the state from what has already been observed in the first chapter of this work 
some notion may be formed of the armies and provinces thus entrusted to the ruling hand of Augustus. But, as it was impossible that he could personally command the regions of so many distant frontiers, he was indulged by the Senate, as Pompey had already been, in the permission of devolving the execution of his great office on a sufficient number of lieutenants. In rank and authority these officers seemed not inferior to the ancient proconsuls, but their station was dependent and precarious. They received and held their commissions at the will of a superior, to whose auspicious influence the merit of their action was legally attributed. They were the representatives of the emperor. The emperor alone was the general of the republic, and his jurisdiction, civil as well as military, extended over all the conquests of Rome. It was some satisfaction, however, to the Senate, that he always delegated his power to the members of their body. The imperial lieutenants were of consular or praetorian dignity, the legions were commanded by senators, and the prefecture of Egypt was the only important trust committed to a Roman knight. Within six days after Augustus had been compelled to accept so very liberal a grant, he resolved to gratify the pride of the Senate by an easy sacrifice. He represented to them that they had enlarged his powers even beyond that degree which might be required by the melancholy condition of their times. They had not permitted him to refuse the laborious command of the armies and the frontiers, but he must insist on being allowed to restore the more peaceful and secure provinces to the mild administration of the civil magistrate. In the division of the provinces, Augustus provided for his own power and for the dignity of the Republic. The proconsuls of the Senate, particularly those of Asia, Greece, and Africa, enjoyed a more honorable character than the lieutenants of the emperor, who commanded in Gaul or Syria. The former were attended by lictors, the latter by soldiers. A law was passed that wherever the emperor was present, his extraordinary commission should supersede the ordinary jurisdiction of the governor, a custom was introduced that the new conquests belonged to the imperial portion, and it was soon discovered that the authority of the prince, the favorite epithet of Augustus, was the same in every part of the empire. In return for this imaginary concession, Augustus obtained an important privilege which rendered him master of Rome and Italy. By a dangerous exception to the ancient maxims, he was authorized to preserve his military command, supported by a numerous body of guards, even in a time of peace, and in the heart of the capital. His command, indeed, was confined to those citizens who were engaged in the service by the military oath, but such was the propensity of the Romans to servitude that the oath was voluntarily taken by the magistrates, the senators, and the equestrian order, till the homage of flattery was insensibly converted into an annual and solemn protestation of fidelity. Although Augustus considered a military force as the firmest foundation, he wisely rejected it as a very odious instrument of government. It was more agreeable to his temper, as well as to his policy, to reign under the venerable names of ancient magistracy, and artfully to collect in his own person all the scattered rays of civil jurisdiction. With this in view, he permitted the Senate to confer upon him, for his life, the powers of the consular and tribunician offices, which were, in the same manner, continued to all his successors. The consuls had succeeded to the kings of Rome, and represented the dignity of the state. They superintended the ceremonies of religion, levied and commanded the legions, gave audience to foreign ambassadors, and presided in the assemblies both of the Senate and people. The general control of the finances was entrusted to their care, and though they seldom had leisure to administer justice in person, they were considered as the supreme guardians of law, equity, and the public peace. Such was their ordinary jurisdiction. But whenever the Senate empowered the first magistrate to consult the safety of the commonwealth, he was raised by that decree above the laws, and exercised, in the defense of liberty, a temporary despotism. The character of the tribunes was, in every respect, different from that of the consuls. The appearance of the former was modest and humble, but their persons were sacred and inviolable. Their force was suited rather for opposition than for action. They were instituted to defend the oppressed, to pardon offenses, to arraign the enemies of the people, and, when they judged it necessary, to stop, by a single word, the whole machine of government. As long as the Republic subsisted, the dangerous influence which either the council or the tribune might derive from their respective jurisdiction was diminished by several important restrictions. Their authority expired with the year in which they were elected. The former office was divided between two, the latter among ten persons, 
and as both in their private and public interest they were averse to each other their mutual conflicts contributed for the most part to strengthen rather than to destroy the balance of the constitution but when the consular and tribunitian powers were united when they were vested for life in a single person when the general of the army was at the same time the minister of the senate and the representative of the roman people it was impossible to resist the exercise nor was it easy to define the limits of his imperial prerogative to these accumulated honors the policy of augustus soon added the splendid as well as important dignities of supreme pontiff and of censor by the former he acquired the management of the religion and by the latter a legal inspection over the manners and fortunes of the roman people if so many distinct and independent powers did not exactly unite with each other the complacence of the senate was prepared to supply every deficiency by the most ample and extraordinary concessions the emperors as the first ministers of the republic were exempted from the obligation and penalty of many inconvenient laws they were authorized to convoke the senate to make several motions in the same day to recommend candidates for the honors of the state to enlarge the bounds of the city to employ the revenue at their discretion to declare peace and war to ratify treaties and by a most comprehensive clause they were empowered to execute whatsoever they should judge advantageous to the empire and agreeable to the majesty of things private or public human or divine when all the various powers of executive government were committed to the imperial magistrate the ordinary magistrates of the commonwealth languished in obscurity without vigor and almost without business the names and forms of the ancient administration were preserved by augustus with the most anxious care the usual number of consuls praetors and tribunes were annually invested with their respective ensigns of office and continued to discharge some of their least important functions those honors still attracted the vain ambition of the romans and the emperors themselves though invested for life with the powers of the consulship frequently aspired to the title of that annual dignity which they condescended to share with the most illustrious of their fellow-citizens in the election of these magistrates the people during the reign of augustus were permitted to expose all the inconveniences of a wild democracy that artful prince instead of discovering the least symptom of impatience humbly solicited their suffrages for himself or his friends and scrupulously practised all the duties of an ordinary candidate but we may venture to ascribe to his counsels the first measure of the succeeding reign by which the elections were transferred to the senate the assemblies of the people were forever abolished and the emperors were delivered from a dangerous multitude who without restoring liberty might have disturbed and perhaps endangered the established government by declaring themselves the protectors of the people marius and caesar had subverted the constitution of their country but as soon as the senate had been humbled and disarmed such an assembly consisting of five or six hundred persons was found a much more tractable and useful instrument of dominion it was on the dignity of the senate that augustus and his successors founded their new empire and they affected on every occasion to adopt the language and principles of patricians in the administration of their own powers they frequently consulted the great national council and seemed to refer to its decisions the most important concerns of peace and war rome italy and the internal provinces were subject to the immediate jurisdiction of the senate with regard to civil objects it was the supreme court of appeal with regard to criminal matters a tribunal constituted for the trial of all offences that were committed by men in any public station or that affected the peace and majesty of the roman people the exercise of the judicial power became the most frequent and serious occupation of the senate and the important causes that were pleaded before them afforded a last refuge to the spirit of ancient eloquence as a council of state and as a court of justice the senate possessed very considerable prerogatives but in its legislative capacity in which it was supposed virtually to represent the people the rights of sovereignty were acknowledged to reside in that assembly every power was derived from their authority every law was ratified by their sanction their regular meetings were held on three stated days in every month the calends the nones and the ides the debates were conducted with decent freedom and the emperors themselves who gloried in the name of senators sat voted and divided with their equals to resume in a few words the system of imperial government as it was instituted by augustus and maintained by those princes who understood their own interest and that of the people it may be defined an absolute monarchy disguised by the forms of a commonwealth 
the masters of the Roman world surrounded their throne with darkness, concealed their irresistible strength, and humbly professed themselves the accountable ministers of the Senate, whose supreme decrees they dictated and obeyed. The face of the court corresponded with the forms of the administration. The emperors, if we accept those tyrants whose capricious folly violated every law of nature and decency, disdained the pomp and ceremony which might offend their countrymen but could add nothing to their real power. In all the offices of life they affected to confound themselves with their subjects, and maintained with them an equal intercourse of visit and entertainments. Their habit, their palace, their table, were suited only to the rank of an opulent senator. Their family, however numerous or splendid, was composed entirely of their domestic slaves and freedmen. Augustus or Trajan would have blushed at employing the meanest of Romans in those menial offices which, in the household and bedchamber of a limited monarch, are so eagerly solicited by the proudest nobles of Britain. The deification of the emperors is the only instance in which they departed from their accustomed prudence and modesty. The Asiatic Greeks were the first inventors and successors of Alexander the first objects of this servile and impious mode of adulation. It was easily transferred from the kings to the governors of Asia, and the Roman magistrates very frequently were adored as provincial deities with the pomp of altars and temples, of festivals and sacrifices. It was natural that the emperors should not refuse what the proconsuls had accepted, and the divine honors which both the one and the other received from the provinces attested rather the despotism than the servitude of Rome. But the conquerors soon imitated the vanquished nations in the arts of flattery, and the imperious spirit of the first Caesar too easily consented to assume, during his lifetime, a place among the tutelar deities of Rome. The milder temper of his successor declined so dangerous an ambition which was never afterwards revived, except by the madness of Caligula and Domitian. Augustus permitted, indeed, some of the provincial cities to erect temples to his honor, on condition that they should associate the worship of Rome with that of the sovereign. He tolerated private superstition, of which he might be the object, but he contented himself with being revered by the senate and the people in his human character, and wisely left to his successor the care of his public deification. A regular custom was introduced that on the decease of every emperor who had neither lived nor died like a tyrant, the senate, by a solemn decree, would place him in the number of the gods, and the ceremonies of his apotheosis were blended with those of his funeral. This legal, and, it would seem, injudicious profanation, so abhorrent to their stricter principles, was received with a very faint murmur by the easy nature of polytheism. But it was received as an institution not of religion, but of policy. We should disgrace the virtues of the Antonines by comparing them with the vices of Hercules or Jupiter. Even the characters of Caesar or Augustus were far superior to those of the popular deities. But it was the misfortune of the former to live in the enlightened age, and their actions were too faithfully recorded to admit of such a mixture of fable and mystery as the devotion of the vulgar requires. As soon as their divinity was established by law, it sunk into oblivion, without contributing either to their own fame or to the dignity of succeeding princes. In the consideration of the imperial government, we have frequently mentioned the artful founder, under his well-known title of Augustus, which was not, however, conferred upon him till the edifice was almost completed. The obscure name of Octavianus he derived from a mean family in the little town of Aricia. It was stained with the blood of the proscription, and he was desirous, had it been possible, to erase all memory of his former life. The illustrious surname of Caesar he had assumed as the adopted son of the dictator but he had too much good sense either to hope to be confounded or to wish to be compared with that extraordinary man. It was proposed in the Senate to dignify their minister with a new appellation, and after a serious discussion, that of Augustus was chosen, among several others, as being the most expressive of the character of peace and sanctity which he uniformly affected. Augustus was therefore a personal, Caesar, a family, distinction. The former should naturally have expired with the prince on whom it was bestowed, and however the latter was diffused by adoption and female alliance, Nero was the last prince who could allege any hereditary claim to the honors of the Julian line. But, at the time of his death, the practice of a century had inseparably connected those appellations with the imperial dignity, and they have been preserved by a long succession of emperors, Romans, Greeks, Franks, and Germans, from the fall of the Republic to the present time. A distinction was, however, soon introduced, 
the sacred title of augustus was always reserved for the monarch whilst the name of caesar was more freely communicated to his relations and from the reign of hadrian at least was appropriated to the second person in the state who was considered as the presumptive heir of the empire End of chapter 3, part 1chapter three part two of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org that's l i b r i v o x dot o r g recording by christy nowak chapter three the constitution in the age of the antonines part two the tender respect of Augustus for a free constitution which he had destroyed can only be explained by an attentive consideration of the character of that subtle tyrant. A cool head, an unfeeling heart, and a cowardly disposition prompted him at the age of nineteen to assume the mask of hypocrisy which he never afterwards laid aside. With the same hand, and probably with the same temper, he signed the proscription of Cicero and the pardon of Cinna. His virtues, and even his vices, were artificial, and according to the various dictates of his interest, he was at first the enemy, and at last the father of the Roman world. When he framed the artful system of the imperial authority, his moderation was inspired by his fears. He wished to deceive the people by an image of civil liberty, and the armies by an image of civil government. 1. The death of Caesar was ever before his eyes. He had lavished wealth and honors on his adherents, but the most favored friends of his uncle were in the number of the conspirators. The fidelity of the legions might defend his authority against open rebellion, but their vigilance could not secure his person from the dagger of a determined republican, and the Romans, who revered the memory of Brutus, would applaud the imitation of his virtue. Caesar had provoked his fate as much as by the ostentation of his power as by his power itself. The consul or the tribune might have reigned in peace. The title of king had armed the Romans against his life. Augustus was sensible that mankind is governed by names, nor was he deceived in his expectation that the senate and people would submit to slavery, provided they were respectfully assured that they still enjoyed their ancient freedom. A feeble senate and an enervated people cheerfully acquiesced in the pleasing illusion, as long as it was supported by the virtue or even by the prudence, of the successors of Augustus. It was a motive of self-preservation, not a principle of liberty, that animated the conspirators against Caligula, Nero, and Domitian. They attacked the person of the tyrant, without aiming their blow at the authority of the emperor. There appears indeed one memorable occasion in which the Senate, after seventy years of patience, made an ineffectual attempt to reassume its long-forgotten rights. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital, condemned the memory of the Caesars, gave the watchword liberty to the few cohorts who faintly adhered to their standard, and, during the eight-and-forty hours, acted as the independent chiefs of a free commonwealth. But, while they deliberated, the Praetorian guards had resolved. The stupid Claudius, brother of Germanicus, was already in their camp, invested with the imperial purple, and prepared to support his election by arms. The dream of liberty was at an end, and the Senate awoke to all the horrors of inevitable servitude. Deserted by the people, and threatened by a military force, that feeble assembly was compelled to ratify the choice of the Praetorians, and to embrace the benefit of amnesty, which Claudius had the prudence to offer, and the generosity to observe. Note. See the capital. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital. End note. 2. The insolence of the armies inspired Augustus with fears of a still more alarming nature. The despair of the citizens could only attempt what the power of the soldiers was at any time able to execute. How precarious was his own authority over men whom he had taught to violate every social duty! He had heard their seditious clamors, he dreaded their calmer moments of reflection. One revolution had been purchased by immense rewards, but a second revolution might double those rewards. The troops professed the fondest attachment to the house of Caesar, but the attachments of the multitude are capricious and inconstant. 
Augustus summoned to his aid whatever remained in those fierce minds of the Roman prejudices, enforced the rigor of discipline by the sanction of law, and, interposing the majesty of the Senate between the emperor and the army, boldly claimed their allegiance as the first magistrate of the Republic. During a long period of two hundred and twenty years from the establishment of this artful system to the death of Commodus, the dangers inherent to a military government were, in a great measure, suspended. The soldiers were seldom roused to that fatal sense of their own strength, and of the weakness of the civil authority, which was, before and afterwards, productive of such dreadful calamities. Caligula and Domitian were assassinated in their palace by their own domestics. The convulsions which agitated Rome on the death of the former were confined to the walls of the city. But Nero involved the whole empire in his ruin. In the space of eighteen months, four princes perished by the sword, and the Roman world was shaken by the fury of the contending armies. Excepting only this short, though violent eruption of military license, the two centuries from Augustus to Commodus passed away unstained with civil blood, and undisturbed by revolutions. The emperor was elected by the authority of the senate and the consent of the soldiers. The legions respected their oath of fidelity, and it requires a minute inspection of the Roman annals to discover three inconsiderable rebellions, which were all suppressed in a few months, and without even the hazard of a battle. In elective monarchies, the vacancy of the throne is a moment big with danger and mischief. The Roman emperors, desirous to spare the legions that interval of suspense, and the temptation of an irregular choice, invested their designed successor with so large a share of present power as should enable him, after their decease, to assume the remainder without suffering the empire to perceive the change of masters. Thus Augustus, after all his fairer prospects had been snatched from him by untimely deaths, rested his last hopes on Tiberius, obtained for his adopted son the censorial and tribunician powers, and dictated a law by which the future prince was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. Thus Vespasian subdued the generous mind of his eldest son, Titus was adored by the eastern legions, which, under his command, had recently achieved the conquest of Judea. His power was dreaded, and, as his virtues were clouded by the intemperance of youth, his designs were suspected. Instead of listening to such unworthy suspicion, the prudent monarch associated Titus to the full powers of the imperial dignity, and the grateful son ever approved himself the humble and faithful minister of so indulgent a father. The good sense of Vespasian engaged him indeed to embrace every measure that might confirm his recent and precarious elevation. The military oath and the fidelity of the troops had been consecrated by the habits of a hundred years to the name and family of the Caesars, and although that family had been continued only by the fictitious right of adoption, the Romans still revered, in the person of Nero, the grandson of Germanicus, and the lineal successor of Augustus. It was not without reluctance and remorse that the Praetorian guards had been persuaded to abandon the cause of the tyrant. The rapid downfall of Galba, Otho, and Vitellius taught the armies to consider the emperors as the creatures of their will and the instruments of their license. The birth of Vespasian was mean. His grandfather had been a private soldier, his father a petty officer of the revenue. His own merit had raised him in an advanced age to the empire, but his merit was rather useful than shining, and his virtues were disgraced by a strict and even sordid parsimony. Such a prince consulted his true interest by the association of a son whose more splendid and amiable character might turn the public attention from the obscure origin to the future glories of the Flavian house. Under the mild administration of Titus, the Roman world enjoyed a transient felicity, and his beloved memory served to protect, above fifteen years, the vices of his brother Domitian. Nerva had scarcely accepted the purple from the assassins of Domitian before he discovered that his feeble age was unable to stem the torrent of public disorders which had multiplied under the long tyranny of his predecessor. His mild disposition was respected by the good, but the degenerate Romans required a more vigorous character, whose justice should strike terror into the guilty. Though he had several relations, he fixed his choice on a stranger. He adopted Trajan, then about forty years of age, who commanded a powerful army in the lower Germany, and immediately, by decree of the Senate, declared him his colleague and successor in the empire.' 
it is sincerely to be lamented that whilst we are fatigued with the disgustful relation of nero's crimes and follies we are reduced to collect the actions of trajan from the glimmerings of an abridgment or the doubtful light of a panegyric there remains however one panegyric far removed beyond the suspicion of flattery above two hundred and fifty years after the death of trajan the senate in pouring out the customary acclamations on the accession of a new emperor wished that he might surpass the felicity of augustus and the virtue of trajan we may readily believe that the father of his country hesitated whether he ought to entrust the various and doubtful character of his kinsman hadrian with sovereign power in his last moments the arts of the empress plotina either fixed the irresolution of trajan or boldly supposed a fictitious adoption the truth of which could not be safely disputed and hadrian was peaceably acknowledged as his lawful successor under his reign as had been already mentioned the empire flourished in peace and prosperity he encouraged the arts reformed the laws asserted military discipline and visited all his provinces in person his vast and active genius was equally suited to the most enlarged views and the minute details of civil policy. But the ruling passions of his soul were curiosity and vanity. As they prevailed, and as they were attracted by different objects, Hadrian was, by turns, an excellent prince, a ridiculous sophist, and a jealous tyrant. The general tenor of his conduct deserved praise for its equity and moderation. Yet in the first days of his reign he put to death four councillor senators, his personal enemies and men who had been judged worthy of empire and the tediousness of a painful illness rendered him at last peevish and cruel the senate doubted whether they should pronounce him a god or a tyrant and the honors decreed to his memory were granted to the prayers of the pious antoninus the caprice of hadrian influenced his choice of a successor after revolving in his mind several men of distinguished merit whom he esteemed and hated he adopted alias verus a gay and voluptuous nobleman recommended by uncommon beauty to the lover of antoninus but whilst hadrian was delighting himself with his own applause and the acclamations of the soldiers whose consent had been secured by an immense donative the new caesar was ravished from his embraces by an untimely death he left only one son hadrian commended the boy to the gratitude of the antonines he was adopted by pius and on the accession of marcus was invested with an equal share of sovereign power among the many vices of this younger verus he possessed one virtue a dutiful reverence to his wiser colleague to whom he willingly abandoned the ruder cares of empire the philosophic emperor dissembled his follies lamented his early death and cast a decent veil over his memory as soon as hadrian's passion was either gratified or disappointed he resolved to deserve the thanks of posterity by placing the most exalted merit on the roman throne his discerning eye easily discovered a senator about fifty years of age blameless in all the offices of life and a youth of about seventeen whose riper years opened a fair prospect of every virtue the elder of these was declared the son and successor of hadrian on condition however that he himself should immediately adopt the younger the two Antonines, for it is of them we are now speaking, governed the Roman world forty-two years with the same invariable spirit of wisdom and virtue. Although Pius had two sons, he preferred the welfare of Rome to the interest of his family, gave his daughter Faustina in marriage to young Marcus, obtained from the Senate the tribunician and proconsular powers, and, with a noble disdain, or rather ignorance of jealousy, associated him to all the labors of government." marcus on the other hand revered the character of his benefactor loved him as a parent obeyed him as his sovereign and after he was no more regulated his own administration by the example and maxims of his predecessor their united reigns are possibly the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government titus antoninus pius has been justly denominated a second numa the same love of religion justice and peace was the distinguishing characteristic of both princes but the situation of the latter opened a much larger field for the exercise of those virtues numa could only prevent a few neighboring villages from plundering each other's harvests antoninus diffused order and tranquillity over the greatest part of the earth his reign is marked by the rare advantage of furnishing very few materials for history which is indeed little more than the register of crimes follies and misfortunes of mankind in private life he was an amiable as well as a good man the native simplicity of his virtue was a stranger to vanity or affectation
He enjoyed with moderation the conveniences of his fortune and the innocent pleasures of society, and the benevolence of his soul displayed itself in a cheerful serenity of temper. The virtue of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus was of a severer and more laborious kind. It was the well-earned harvest of many a learned conference, of many a patient lecture, and many a midnight lucubration. At the age of twelve years he embraced the rigid system of the Stoics, which taught him to submit his body to his mind, his passions to his reason, to consider virtue as the only good, vice as the only evil, all things external as things indifferent. His meditations, composed in the tumult of camp, are still extant, and he even condescended to give lessons of philosophy in a more public manner than was perhaps consistent with the modesty of a sage or the dignity of an emperor. But his life was the noblest commentary on the precepts of Zeno. He was severe to himself, indulgent to the imperfection of others, just and beneficent to all mankind. He regretted that Avidius Cassius, who excited a rebellion in Syria, had disappointed him by a voluntary death of the pleasure of converting an enemy to a friend, and he justified the sincerity of that sentiment by moderating the zeal of the Senate against the adherence of the traitor. War he detested, as the disgrace and calamity of human nature, but when the necessity of a just defense called upon him to take up arms, he readily exposed his person to eight winter campaigns on the frozen banks of the Danube, the severity of which was at last fatal to the weakness of his constitution. His memory was revered by a grateful posterity, and above a century after his death many persons preserved the image of Marcus Antoninus among those of their household gods. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted in the image of liberty and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. Such princes deserved the honor of restoring the Republic, had the Romans of their days been capable of enjoying a rational freedom. The labors of these monarchs were overpaid by the immense reward that inseparably waited on their success, by the honest pride of virtue, and by the exquisite delight of beholding the general happiness of which they were the authors. A just but melancholy reflection embittered, however, the noblest of human enjoyments. They must often have recollected the instability of a happiness which depended on the character of a single man. The fatal moment was perhaps approaching, when some licentious youth, or some jealous tyrant, would abuse, to the destruction, that absolute power which they had exerted for the benefit of their people. The ideal restraints of the Senate and the laws might serve to display the virtues, but could never correct the vices of the emperor. The military force was a blind and irresistible instrument of oppression, and the corruption of Roman manners would always supply flatterers eager to applaud, and ministers prepared to serve, the fear or the avarice, the lust or the cruelty of their masters. These gloomy apprehensions had been already justified by the experience of the Romans. The annals of the emperors exhibit a strong and various picture of human nature, which we should vainly seek among the mixed and doubtful characters of modern history. In the conduct of those monarchs we may trace the utmost lines of vice and virtue, the most exalted perfection, and the meanest degeneracy of our own species. The golden age of Trajan and the Antonines had been preceded by an age of iron. It is almost superfluous to enumerate the unworthy successors of Augustus. Their unparalleled vices and the splendid theater on which they were acted have saved them from oblivion. The dark, unrelenting Tiberius, the furious Caligula, the feeble Claudius, the profligate and cruel Nero, the beastly Vitellius, and the timid, inhuman Domitian are condemned to everlasting infamy. During fourscore years, excepting only the short and doubtful respite of Vespasian's reign, Rome groaned beneath the unremitting tyranny which exterminated the ancient families of the Republic and was fatal to almost every virtue and every talent that arose in that unhappy period. Under the reign of these monsters, the slavery of the Romans was accompanied by two peculiar circumstances, the one occasioned by their former liberty, 
the other by their extensive conquests, which rendered their condition more completely wretched than that of the victims of tyranny in any other age or country. From these causes were derived, one, the exquisite sensibility of the sufferers, and, two, the impossibility of escaping from the hand of the oppressor. 1. When Persia was governed by the descendants of Sephi, the race of princes whose wanton cruelty often stained their divan, their table, and their bed with the blood of their favorites, there is a saying recorded of a young nobleman that he never departed from the sultan's presence without satisfying himself whether his head was still on his shoulders. The experience of every day might almost justify the skepticism of Rustan, yet the fatal sword, suspended above him by a single thread, seems not to have disturbed the slumbers or interrupted the tranquillity of the Persian. The monarch's frown, he well knew, could level him with the dust, but the stroke of lightning or apoplexy might be equally fatal, and it was the part of a wise man to forget the inevitable calamities of human life in the enjoyment of the fleeting hour." He was dignified with the appellation of the king's slave, had perhaps been purchased from obscure parents in a country which he had never known, and was trained up from his infancy in the severe discipline of the seraglio. His name, his wealth, his honors were the gift of a master who might, without injustice, resume what he had bestowed. Rustan's knowledge, if he possessed any, could only serve to confirm his habits by prejudices. His language afforded not words for any form of government except absolute monarchy. The history of the East informed him that such had ever been the condition of humankind. The Koran and the interpreters of that divine book inculcated to him that the Sultan was the descendant of the Prophet, and the vicegerent of heaven, that patience was the first virtue of a Muslim, and unlimited obedience the great duty of a subject. The minds of the Romans were very differently prepared for slavery. Oppressed beneath the weight of their own corruption and of military violence, they, for a long while, preserved the sentiments, or at least the ideas, of their free-born ancestors. The education of Helvidius and Thracia, of Tacitus and Pliny, was the same as that of Cato and Cicero. From Grecian philosophy they had imbibed the justest and most liberal notions of the dignity of human nature and the origin of civil society. The history of their own country had taught them to revere a free, a virtuous, and a victorious commonwealth, to abhor the successful crimes of Caesar and Augustus, and inwardly to despise those tyrants whom they adored with the same abject flattery. As magistrates and senators, they were admitted into the great council, which had once dictated laws to the earth, whose authority was so often prostituted to the vilest purposes of tyranny. Tiberius, and those emperors who adopted his maxims, attempted to disguise their murders by the formalities of justice, and perhaps enjoyed a secret pleasure in rendering the Senate their accomplice as well as their victim. By this assembly, the last of the Romans were condemned for imaginary crimes and real virtues. Their infamous accusers assumed the language of independent patriots, who arraigned a dangerous citizen before the tribunal of his country, and the public service was rewarded by riches and honors. The servile judges professed to assert the majesty of the commonwealth, violated the person of its first magistrate, whose clemency they most applauded when they trembled the most at his inexorable and impending cruelty. The tyrant beheld their baseness with just contempt, and encountered their secret sentiments of detestation with sincere and avowed hatred for the whole body of the Senate. 2. The division of Europe into a number of independent states, connected, however, with each other by the general resemblance of religion, language, and manners, is productive of the most beneficial consequences to the liberty of mankind. A modern tyrant, who should find no resistance either in his own breast or in his people, would soon experience a gentle restraint from the example of his equals, the dread of present censure, the advice of his allies, and the apprehension of his enemies. The object of his displeasure, escaping from the narrow limits of his dominions, would easily obtain, in a happier climate, a secret refuge, a new fortune adequate to his merit, the freedom of complaint, and perhaps the means of revenge. But the empire of the Romans filled the world, and when the empire fell into the hands of a single person, the world became a safe and dreary prison for his enemies." The slave of imperial despotism, whether he was condemned to drag his gilded chain in Rome in the Senate, or were to live out a life of exile on the barren rock of Seraphis, or the frozen bank of the Danube, expected his fate in silent despair. To resist was fatal, and it was impossible to fly.' 
on every side he was encompassed with a vast extent of sea and land which he could never hope to traverse without being discovered seized and restored to his irritated master beyond the frontiers his anxious view could discover nothing except the ocean inhospitable deserts hostile tribes of barbarians of fierce manners and unknown language or dependent kings who would gladly purchase the emperor's protection by the sacrifice of an obnoxious fugitive wherever you are said cicero to the exiled marcellus remember that you are equally within the power of the conqueror end of chapter three part two